What's the one thing that you can't live without? There's a possibility that one of those things came from the state of Illinois. The land of Lincoln should probably have the secondary nickname the land of dreamers because we have had some imaginative residents. Here are five inventions and their creators who came from the state of Illinois. A few decades ago, the general public was introduced to the idea of a device that would let you speak to someone over the airwaves. Viewers of the TV show Star Trek would see Captain James T. Kirk communicate with his crew through a handheld communicator, similar to a walkie-talkie, but this device was different. The static that would occur with a walkie-talkie was gone, and the communication was unlikely to be intercepted because it went to a specific recipient. In the 1970s, Bell Labs tasked its researchers with figuring out how a cellular phone network could work, and by the end of the decade, the Bell Labs advanced mobile phone system was in place. At the same time, an engineer in Schaumburg, working for Motorola, named Martin Cooper, was trying to figure out how to make a Star Trek communications device that anyone could use. He came up with this idea in 1973, but it wasn't until 1984 that they released the first cell phone. It was the Dynatac 8000X, but it was nicknamed the brick or the shoe because it was so big. It weighed 2.5 pounds and was 10 inches long, so you could get a workout in while talking. But you would have to make it a short workout because the battery was only good for about 20 minutes before it would need to recharge for 10 hours. That first model wasn't exactly efficient. It also wasn't affordable. The price tag would be the equivalent of around $10,000 in today's money. It wasn't until much later when they figured out how to make these more affordable that they started to take off. But to the chagrin of the cell phone companies, the people buying their products were not their target audience. They had expected business people to use the phones as a way of extending their reach outside of the office, but they found that it was teenagers in the late 90s who really made the cell phone the cultural icon that it is today. In the late 1800s, in the small town of Shelbyville, lived a wealthy socialite named Josephine Cochran. She loved to entertain people at her mansion with elaborate dinner parties on antique china that dated back to the 1600s. But she found that after her guests had left, and the work of putting the house back in order was in full swing, some of her precious china would inevitably get chipped by her servants when they hand washed them. Not trusting them to do the task, she started doing it herself, but she found that it was a mundane chore and she hated it. She finally became so exasperated by doing dishes that she yelled out, If nobody else is going to invent a dishwashing machine, I'll do it myself! Her first few attempts were unsuccessful, mostly because the men she hired to help her with the mechanics of it thought they knew better, and they changed her design. You know how that goes, the men folk know better than the little lady. Finally, she teamed up with a man named George Butters, who built the machine to her specifications, and voila, it worked. The patent for her dishwasher was issued on December 28, 1886, and she started making them at her new Garris Cochran Manufacturing Company. Her company later became part of the KitchenAid Company, and the first KitchenAid dishwasher based on Cochran's design was introduced in 1949. With this entry, it needs to be clarified that when DeKalb claims credit for barbed wire, they really mean modern barbed wire, because there was a previous version that was patented by Lucian Smith of Kent, Ohio in 1867. A DeKalb man named Joseph Glidden came along and tweaked the design in 1873. He would use a coffee mill to make the barbs. Then he would attach the barbs to the fence by twisting another piece of wire around it. Glidden received a patent for his design on November 28, 1874. There was some debate as to whether this was actually a new design or not, and it caused a legal battle that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. They ruled in Glidden's favor in 1892. He then founded the Barbed Wire Company in DeKalb. Thanks to his patent, Glidden received royalty payments from his version of Barbed Wire, so between his company and the royalties, when he died in 1906, he was one of the richest men in America. John Deere was a blacksmith from Vermont who settled in a tiny unincorporated settlement in Illinois called Grand Detour. He found that farmers in Illinois were using cast iron plows, but they required constant maintenance because they just weren't up to dealing with the soil of Illinois. Deere pondered this and came to the conclusion that steel would be a better material for the plow, so he came up with a few different designs before he finally found the one that he liked the best in 1837. He completed and sold his first one to a neighboring farmer the next year. Word spread of how his plow helped farmers, and before long he was selling 75 to 100 per year. In 1843, Deere took on a business partner named Leonard Andrus to help him produce more plows because he was having trouble keeping up with the demand. However, that partnership was short-lived. 
Deer wanted to sell his plows to people outside of his own community, so he wanted a railroad to go through Grand Detour. Andrus was opposed to that, and Deer didn't trust him anyway, so he dissolved the partnership and moved his business to Moline. By 1855, John Deere was selling 10,000 plows each year. His invention became known as the plow that broke the plains. He died in 1886, but his name lives on through his namesake company. Can you imagine what it must have been like to live in a time when, if you had a toothache, someone would rip the tooth out of your head without any sort of pain reliever or numbing agent? Thanks to Dr. Green Vardaman Black, we don't have to endure the excruciating pain that our ancestors went through. After serving in the Civil War, Black relocated to the Jacksonville area and began studying in the field of dentistry and later trained other dentists in the field. Dr. Black came up with his classification of caries lesions, which is still in use today. Caries are commonly referred to as cavities. In addition to his classification system, he devised the technique for filling cavities. If a person received a filling before 1965, it was probably done using Dr. Black's balanced amalgam formula, which was considered the gold standard for dental fillings for 70 years. Dr. Black can be thanked for a few other things as well. He's the reason that dentists have to get a degree from a university now. At the time that he trained, a dentist only had to go to school for 20 months before doing an apprenticeship. I don't know about you, but I don't want anyone with less than two years worth of education touching me. He also invented the foot-driven dental drill and was the first to use nitrous oxide while extracting teeth. His contributions have led to him being called the father of modern dentistry. It only takes one dreamer with the drive to see their invention come to fruition to change life in a fundamental way for people. I hope you liked this video. If so, give it a thumbs up. You might also consider subscribing and hitting the notification bell if you haven't already so you don't miss the next video where I'll be going over inventions from Chicago. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, I remain stuck in the Kernfield.